Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us to uh, our second installment of Career Conversations, a Native American heritage celebration. Um, we are joined tonight by Brooke Thompson and Joseph Bull, who will each share about their career path and um, how that has shaped um, their professional lives um, and how their Native American identity has kind of played a part in that as well. Um, we'll hear directly from them. Brooke will speak first and Joe will speak second, and then we will go into some questions um, and kind of have a discussion. Uh, my name is Valentina London. I am the Outreach and Engagement Coordinator at Oregon Mesa. Um, I do <clears throat> these kinds of career talks uh, slash family night uh, events where we try to um, showcase uh, members of the Oregon Mesa community um, to our students so that they can join um, these events virtually. Last time we did it hybrid, so it was an in-person event, and we also had a YouTube live audience. Um, and then sometimes we do these just entirely in person. So tonight's session is uh, completely online on Zoom, but the this recording will be up on YouTube. So for those that are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for clicking on this video and we'll just dive right in. So I'd like to introduce Brooke Thompson, who is going to be our first um, career conversation speaker for tonight. Thank you, Brooke, for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll start with my introduction and my language. So I agree, Nick now, Brooke Thompson, what tech may work, may work. Uh, Santa Cruz Oak, Puda Glawe, Esse Pichikalawe, Ni Picho S. Iwaks, Archie Thompson. So, and my name's Brooke. I'm from the Yurok village, or from the Watek village of the Yurok tribe, and I'm also part Karuk. My grandfather was Archie Thompson, who was the last native speaker of the Yurok language in Northern California. And currently, I'm in Santa Cruz, California. I grew up on and off my reservation in Northern California in the Yurok tribe, which is at the mouth of the Klamath River, which is like the very northwestern part of California. And then between there and then going to school in Portland, Oregon growing up, since Portland had better schools and more opportunities for jobs for my mom than right off the res. And so growing up for me, I always kind of had an interest in STEM in the sense that I wanted to know how the world worked. So I wanted to understand how the things around me work because it kind of felt like magic. Like, why is it that we can have water that freezes and then turns into gas? And why doesn't everything do that? Or just questions that can kind of seem simple, but when you get into it, it gets really complex. And so I started by going to after school clubs. Like we had this club in my elementary school called Mad Science where we just did a little projects, kind of like we ended up doing in Mesa in high school. I went to Franklin High School in Oregon and there's where I really got involved in how to design projects myself and what that looks like to not only learn about issues, but then apply that to real world scenarios, whether it be like a simple egg drop or the wind turbines that you try to get to pick up a certain weight at the Mesa competitions. And so that, in addition to a group that taught me CAD, which is computer aided design really opened my eyes up to the STEM world because I was doing wood shop at the time. My dad's a carpenter. And so he built a lot of the infrastructure in our tribe and he, we always had woodworking tools at home. So a lot of times I would play with the woodworking tools. Like for, I think for Christmas one year, I got like a tiny tool belt with a little hammer and a little tape measure and just go around um, banging nails into random pieces of wood. And helping my dad out on job sites since he couldn't really afford for like daycare or anything being on the res. I would just accompany him on his jobs and see what he was doing in that he could build these huge structures out of nothing. And that was really encouraging to me. And then when I got into woodshop and got to see all these cool things I could then build myself, uh, computer aided design really helped me with making a concept and then making that a reality and that reality more successful. And so when I was in Woodshop, one of my teachers suggested that I go into engineering. 
And so I don't have any engineers in my family. And when I was living on the reservation, like I didn't have any family that went to college. And so having this woodshop teacher was really instrumental to me understanding a career path. I could apply these skills and things I like doing towards. And so I originally was going to do architecture, but then I decided to do engineering first because you can decide it's a bit easier to do the hardest subject, which is usually STEM when you go to college first than it is to do the easier one, which should typically be architecture. Not saying that's like super easy or anything, but STEM is a little more intensive. And so I did that first and ended up loving all my classes. And it's exactly what I want to do where we have all these math and physics and chemistry concepts, and then you apply it to the real world and got to see how you take these ideas we learn about in school and make a reality out of it and then a reality that helps people and that's why I like about civil engineering civil means people and so I got to work and do a job that helped people on a daily basis and then when I was younger I experienced when I was seven years old I experienced the 2002 fish kill which on my reservation was the largest salmon kill in west coast history and nothing has ever happened like that in the history of my tribe where over 60,000 salmon were killed. And that was hard for me because the rivers and fishing is what I did every summer. It's how we made our money. It's how I paid for my school clothes and my school supplies. And these salmon were connections to my ancestors since they took care, my ancestors took care of these salmon's ancestors so that I would have something to eat in a healthy family and that I could continue taking care of them. But yet because of poor water quality, they died within 24 hours and I never wanted to see something like that happen again and so as I got into civil engineering I learned I could learn uh, work on water resources which is pretty much how water works and infrastructure so the built environment around water and now I get to understand how dams work how water pipeline works how transportation of water works which are all related to what happened with the fish kill and so now I get to be the expert for my tribe and get to go to these conferences, get to talk to politicians. Like I had the opportunity to talk to Governor Kate Brown about this and the governor before her, Kitsopper, and really give the indigenous background of what the salmon and what the water means to me as an indigenous person, but mixed with the STEM and the technology side and bridge those two together. And not a lot of people get that bridge because there's not a lot of Indigenous people, especially Indigenous women in STEM. So for me, I've really found my niche there or my niche and that a lot of people do want to hear this opinion and find it really valuable. And because of that, I just kept finding more things to do that I've enjoyed. So I got my bachelor's in engineering from Portland State University. Then I went on to get a master's in engineering and environmental engineering with a focus on water resources and hydrology. So pretty much civil engineering plus a focus with water and then, which was also like amazing to me. I never thought I could go to Stanford and get an engineering degree. That's wild. (laughs) And then I am currently doing a PhD at UC Santa Cruz here in Santa Cruz, California, where I get to live close to the beach. My school's all paid for. They paid for my schools have paid for international travel. So I've been to 15 different countries where I've studied abroad. And I've also get to study how to better integrate. So how California water policy can better incorporate tribes and indigenous knowledge. And so hopefully my research gets to contribute to tribes having more say in water policy and what happens with water, especially since we're so much more affected by climate change than other groups of people are and that we're really needed in this conversation. So basically my indigenous background has, and what my parents did, like my dad being carpenter really pushed me into this field where now I get to kind of be the head honcho and be the thought leader in this area and help push us forward, not only for my tribe, but all tribes in California, which will hopefully also be a model for other states too, like Oregon. So yeah, thank you. And then I'll I'll pass it to my guest, the next guest speaker. Thank you so much, Brooke. That was wonderful. That's, I can't wait to ask you all these questions and hear more. Uh, Next up, we have Dean Joseph Bull, who is the 
Dean um, of the Massey College of Engineering and Computer Science at Portland State University. Thank you, Joe, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It's great to, to be here. And thank you, Brooke. It was great to, to hear a little more about your journey. That's very inspiring. Um, hey, Yule Lintam, Ile Paik. Hello. Welcome. I'm glad that you all came. Um, my name is Joe Bull. I'm the Dean of uh, Engineering, as you just heard, at Portland State uh, University. I'm an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. One of It's a federally recognized tribe of the Lenape. That's not the only Lenape tribe, but it's it's a federally recognized. Uh, there's there's one other in the U.S. and in a and a couple in, in Canada that we started out, uh, you know, historically in in the uh, eastern part of the U.S. around Delaware, and and you know we're relocated to Oklahoma, which is where many of my uh, relatives live. Um, you know, in, in some ways, uh, I think um, you know Brooke and I probably have some similarities uh, in that um, you know I'm also a first uh, generation college graduate that my my dad worked in the construction industry that neither one of my, my college, neither one of my parents by sort of uh, higher ed standards were that uh, educated, but they were two of the smartest people I've ever met, you know, even throughout my career now that I learned a lot from them. Um, you know, a few of the, the things that sort of come to, to mind are, uh, you know, sort of the importance of our community and 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 thinking about things besides our, ourselves and the, the idea that you can can learn a lot of things from anybody, no matter how educated they are, you know, things that I think um, sort of resonate from, from sort of a, a Native perspective. Um, uh, you know, I think in, in many ways, uh, my parents very much valued uh, education. And, um, you know, as a, a small child, I read a lot and, you know, learned a lot of things and built a lot of things that uh, with my, my dad working in the, the construction industry. You know, so he did all kinds of things, built houses, was a, a plumber, built roads. And, you know, a lot of things around building things. And I think that's probably part of why I ended up being an engineer that I, you know, was, if I sort of thought of the people I knew who had uh, been to college and I took away the, the you know, family physician and, and school teachers and then most of the, you know, there are only a handful of other people I, I knew growing up who had been to college and they were mostly, uh, you know, engineers and, and maybe a, a physician and maybe a lawyer, but the um, you know, I think that coupled with, with sort of my my work home in the summers for uh, for my dad and things like that, uh, you know, got me really interested in in how things work and uh, how to 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 build things and to do things that benefit uh, society and our, and our uh, people. Um, you know, so I went to a, a small college in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin Platteville. Uh, and that undergraduate experience for me was uh, transformative. You know, so like I said, I was first gen college student um, and uh, sort of getting plugged into things. And, and I majored in mechanical engineering and sort of seeing that, you know, hey, I, I'm actually really good at this. I'm not just good at this for a, a native first gen kid. I'm good at this compared to everybody else was was really uh, transformative to me. I, I went to graduate school at Northwestern University, got my master's and PhD there. I then was a uh, postdoc in a lab in a uh, medical school uh, where I was the actually the only engineer. So most of my, my faculty career has been in biomedical engineering departments. So I was the only engineer in this lab as a as a postdoc, uh, you know, which was was in many ways very transformative for me as well. And that I, I got to spend a lot of time talking with uh, surgeons. Almost everyone else in the lab was a surgeon. Uh, and um, you know, sort of thinking a lot about how to apply, um, you know, engineering to uh, problems in, in medicine, and, um, you know, also doing a lot of experiments. Uh, you know, I did a lot of experiments in, in theory in my, my PhD, but um, 
you know, the things I, I learned as a kid build on things and work on with my hands were actually really helpful for a lot of my experimental work. And, you know, along the way, I had a lot of great mentors, um, you know, some who were, were native, some who were, were not. My parents and my brother were, of course, very uh, important to me, my, my parents and my, my grandparents, and my family. But, um, you know, then, then my first faculty position was at the University of Michigan. Uh, so I was there as an assistant professor all the way through full professor. So, you know, for folks who, who don't live in the, the higher ed world, but that means that, you know, I got tenure, that I, I you know, did all the things to get promoted to the, the highest level of, of faculty there. And, you know, I was a, a faculty advisor for ACES, the American Indian um, um, Science and Engineering Society. And, and that was a, a wonderful experience. I had a lot of great colleagues who were, were native there, also a lot of great colleagues who were, were BIPOC and, um, you know, just built a lot of great relationships and learned a lot. And then um, I, I was there for, I guess, about 16 years on the faculty. And then I moved to Tulane University in New Orleans, where I was a professor. I had an endowed chair. I was an associate dean, was a department chair, did all of these leadership things. And connected with native folks there, which was was really cool. You know, so like I said, my tribe's not from New Orleans, but it was really cool to to connect with people, uh, you know, other native folks um, who had similar experiences, even though we were in different, you know, from different tribes um, and, and geographically uh, different locations and things. But that was, uh, you know, a lot of fun. And it was kind of interesting, you know, if you kind of think about uh, indigenous ways of knowing and how Native folks uh, know a lot of things that don't always fit in with uh, the way higher ed is, is organized or higher ed folks think about things per se, but that really make a lot of contributions. It was was really cool to to connect with some of the local tribes. And you know, I always kind of remember one of the, the folks I, I got to know from, from one of the tribes in Louisiana mentioned, you know, so uh, New Orleans, way before it was known as as New Orleans, was known as Bolbancho, which in Choctaw is place of other tongues uh, or place where many languages are spoken is sort of the I idea. And it's where tribes would come together to to trade. And um, you know, someone from from one of the local tribes is like, well, you know, back when when we were uh, you know, before the Europeans at Bolbancho, we we knew we didn't want to build a city there because the hurricanes would come and it would flood that we mostly lived other places and went there to to trade and you know that sort of maybe would have been useful knowledge for people to think a little bit about but you know New Orleans was a great city and I loved my my time there and then in August I, I moved to Portland so I've been here not quite six six months um, as dean of the the Massey College of Engineering and Computer Science and uh, yeah, I'm also a professor in the mechanical and materials engineering uh, department. As far as we can tell, um, I'm the only dean of engineering in the country who's an enrolled tribal member, which is, uh, you know, on one hand, it's really exciting to, to, you know, maybe be the first one. But on the other hand, it's like, well, why aren't there more? And that's something I think we as a society, um, you know, need to need to sort out. Um, and and yeah, you know, I'll also say, uh, as far as we can tell, there are two de two department chairs in engineering departments who are uh, enrolled members of, of federally recognized tribes. And, and one of those is Tim Anderson, who's one of my department chairs at Portland State. So, you know, in, in a lot of ways, there are a lot of really cool things about Portland State. And that was part of what attracted me to, to Portland was, you know, it's a large uh, native um, sort of urban Indian population. There are nine federally recognized tribes in the state, and just the opportunity to be involved with uh, Native folks. Uh, you know, it's 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 really wonderful. I have a young daughter that that we go to a lot of powwows in town, and have really connected with a lot of Native folks. And and you know, sort of this this idea of it being a relocation city, and a lot of urban Indians here. You know, it's it's cool to meet people from tribes that 
my tribe's been very connected with in Oklahoma to meet them here in, in Portland and to get to know folks. So, so it's just a really exciting um, place for me to, to be at this point in my career. And I'm, I'm really delighted to, to chat with you all uh, tonight. So thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing, Joe. That's There's so much good stuff that you share that I want to learn more about. Um, I think I'll name um, the common theme that I see is the like knowledge that Native and Indigenous folks have that's just you can't learn that in a classroom and especially Joe talking about like the smartest guy he'd ever known you know didn't necessarily go to school and university like we think smart people quote unquote do um I just I really um value the the knowledge that um indigenous folks have just from their learned experiences and the traditions that get passed down so um, that was really beautiful from both of you. We're now going to move on to our questions for our speakers. Um, there'll be a question on each slide and we'll take turns um, answering them. And uh, we can go in order again, or we can, if you want to take a moment to think about it, you can more than welcome to unmute whoever Joe or Brooke um, would like to share first. Some of them are um, questions that you you do have to kind of think about deeply and um, I'm excited to hear your thoughtful answers. The first question is, what are societal pressures that you have felt as a Native American person in your career field? I, I can go first if, um, yeah? okay. Dean Bull, you want a second to think about it. Um, for, yeah, okay. <laughs> for me, some of the things I think about um, actually come from Portland State specifically. And, and because I, I don't want to pretend like there is no racism or implicit bias that happens when you go to college, because a lot of colleges are predominantly white institutions like Portland State. And with that, and just kind of how poorly American history has been taught in regards to Native Americans, you're going to come across some people who are ignorant. And for me, I was told multiple times while in engineering school at Portland State that I don't belong there, like straight up. And that was because people assumed I only got into school because of affirmative action and that I took a more deserving white person spot, pretty much is what it summed up to. But I was always told and I had the assumption that like my school was funded by the government and that I got school free and that I was taking places when I shouldn't be there and without people really thinking hard about what they were saying. And it's not like these people dislike me individually, because sometimes it'd be even friends who would say things like that, or people I considered friends at the time, at least. But they just weren't used to seeing Indigenous people in these spaces. And there are so many times in university where I was the first Native American person they've ever met in their entire lives. And to me, that's, I feel bad for them because hanging out with Indigenous peoples is amazing <laughs> and they're missing out on a lot of good food and fun. But that's not a fault of their own, but that definitely made me feel like I didn't belong in university or in engineering. And the fact that I was the only student in a lot of my classes that was Native. And also, and if I was there was one other person, one or two people max that were native in the entire six years I did my program. And there was maybe two times they're in the same class with me and that's it. And there was no teachers that looked like me or were also native American. And so for me, not having those role models when I got into the program really was rough. And it's so I like just having uh, us here today, like Hopefully I get a PhD in the future, but having two natives who will have PhDs or are going on that path is so rare and unique. <laughs> and so it's very exciting that you've invited us here today and especially both coming from Portland State University. That's <laughs> in engineering, this is kind of a unicorn situation. <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, those are definitely pressures, not having those role models. But for me at Portland State University, I helped restart the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, 
where I helped create that community for myself of other natives in STEM or those who are STEM adjacent. So we could talk about issues we saw or just have fun and play mini golf and create that sense of community that I couldn't find in my engineering class. So that community was out there, just took longer and was more rough for me to find it and create it than it was maybe for some other students of different backgrounds. Yeah. Oh, I hear that. That's, uh, yeah, I have so many thoughts about that and especially feeling underrepresented and like looking for people that look like you, especially like when you're in college and you look to your professor so much for um, like as a as a role model, especially if you wanted to pursue a path in academia, which personally I considered for a while. And then I was like, I have never even seen a Latina woman, a Chilean woman um, in as a professor at a university. So that's not something I can do. So you just get into that mindset where you rule out things for yourself. But um, yeah, I totally feel that. Dean Bold, do you have thoughts yeah, about this question? Yeah, so, so I, I, yeah, first of all, so sorry you, you had some of that experience at, at, at Portland State, uh, Brooke. The, uh, uh, well, you weren't the dean at the time, so <laughs> yeah, I wasn't here. But but you know, sadly, that's that's an experience I think a lot of Native folks have uh, in in college, and you know, it's something. Um, you know, I think I think we're we're going to to change, but but you know, is is an is is far more common than it should be. That um, you know, so so I guess in terms of societal pressures, I felt as a Native American person in my career field, you know, yes, it was, it was sort of the same thing of of being the only Native person in in many of my classes and things. Um, but I think um, the one I'll I'll sort of point to is, you know, then later in my career, you know, once I was done with graduate school, and um, I, I suspect you know other folks get this earlier in their career as well. But you know, sort of this idea that. Uh, you know, you end up spending some amount of your time educating other people about Native history and Native culture. And, you know, part of that's really enjoyable and it's a lot of fun to, to do. On the other hand, you kind of have to find that balance of what works for you, because if you don't, that turns into, you know, that could be a full-time job on its own. And, you know, you have an actual job to to do besides educate on other folks about your your culture and your your community and you know explain on things like well you know what was wrong with what you were taught in in high school or grade school about Native American history and you know why is it not true that that um, you know, college is is free, or that uh, you know natives don't pay tax, or whatever other fallacy might be out there that um, you know is is not not grounded at all in reality. But um, you know, and and to me, it's it the the optimistic thing is that you know it's nice that that some folks are very interested and do want to work towards educating themselves um and it you know and i'm i'm happy to to talk with folks and to be uh you know very very engaged in that but i think uh you know overall for for native folks it's often that you have to find the balance that works for you that you're comfortable doing both from what you want to do but also from what you actually have the bandwidth to do yeah that's so true. Um, yeah, sometimes you only have the bandwidth for. It's important to set those boundaries. Um, and I, I definitely have heard from my friends who are Native American um, that it takes a lot out of them to have to educate people about Native history or just um, to like talk about the the things that are wrong because um, it's important for them to to correct those, you know, they don't want folks thinking that, you know, X, Y, and Z is a thing. They want to correct the record, but also it takes a lot of, um, out of your, your mental health to have to do that over and over again. Um, so yeah, that's, it's very real. Um, going over to the next question. This is a little bit more, uh, specifically about your field, um, but it, it can also be tied to your heritage and it can also be 
linked to that. But the question specifically, why do you feel passionate about your field? And why is it important? I I see that why is an important question as a twofold. I feel like why is your field important? This could be one question, or why is it important to be passionate about your field? Um, you could take that however you'd like. And whoever would like to go first can go ahead and unmute. Yeah, I'll, I'll return the favor and give you a few minutes to think. So, so um, you know, I'll, I'll answer this in sort of two two parts, you know, so one is, is sort of my field as an academic, and that's biomedical engineering coming from sort of a, a, you know, mechanical engineering undergrad perspective. And that's, you know, I'm passionate about that because it's, you know, about doing things that help people, you know, ultimately, most of my research over my career has been driven by the idea that, um, you know, applying engineering principles to medical problems, find solutions to real clinical problems, and the engineers are problem solvers, and, you know, and that makes makes society better off. But then the second part of that, I, not the why is it important, but the second part of what my field is, you know, so so for most of the, the past, um, you know, years that I was an associate dean and department chair, and now as a, a dean, you know, I would kind of view my field as really the business of engineering higher ed, and that includes research and education. And it, it, part of that, why I'm really passionate about it is that I think, you know, I do have sort of this, this unique opportunity to engage Native folks and underrepresented folks, folks who have historically been marginalized and haven't been as full participants in STEM and in particular engineering as they, they should be. That I have an opportunity as dean to to do something about that, and I'm really excited about that. And you know, I, I'll sort of you know qualify this by by you know there are a couple reasons that I would say this is is really important. Um, you know, the first is that you know just from wh what our values are of you know not involving. Uh, People, you know, there there being such a small number of of native folks, but BIPOC folks in general in in engineering is something that you know just from a value standpoint is something that that needs to to change. Uh, from sort of an engineering standpoint, you get the best solutions to hard problems when you have a diverse team. So why wouldn't you, as an engineer, want to have a a really diverse team? So that's that's really important. And then. You know, even if people didn't see the value in that, and I happen to see a ton of value in the first one and the second one, but even if people don't don't see the value in that, you know, there's sort of the, the idea that the things that you do to engage and and help folks be successful and and feel like they belong and find their community in in a field like engineering uh, doesn't just benefit folks from underrepresented groups that benefits everybody you know so as we do those things well we benefit everybody and that's great for the the profession and great for higher education so so you know i'm really excited about that and then you start you know so that's why i think that's important and why i'm passionate about it then then the second way to interpret why is it important well you know i i really think in in academia and any of our careers find out the things you're excited about and that you're passionate about and put on your energy into those are the the things that that are important and you know i know the the target audience for for this talk is mostly uh, students who aren't even in college yet and and maybe aren't even thinking about academia as a career. But, you know, I really think that's the way you are successful in your career is to find the things you're passionate about and figure out how to how to have that as a, a career. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to. Thank you for that. Yeah, I feel like that's exactly what I'm doing. I get to do things I'm passionate about every day and I really get to help decide the future what happens with California and water policy and helping tribes to have that representation and have that say when we make water decisions. And so for me, that's something I can be excited about working on every day. And I get paid for it too, which is a plus on top of that. So for example, I also work part-time for my tribe. I work for the Iraq tribe as a restoration engineer. And when I was getting my degree at Portland State University, my tribe didn't hire engineers. 
that wasn't even an option for me while I was in college, but I had to just believe that there would be job opportunities for me in the future and there would be a way for me to contribute to my tribe eventually. And my, my tribe is the largest tribe in California. We're about 6,000 members, but we only really created our government 30 years ago when they only had a handful of employees. And now we have a few hundred employees. And with that, we've grown with restoration projects. So restoration being how do we restore the environment and make it healthier? And so now I get to work on a team of other native engineers. We There's only three of us who graduate around the same time in my tribe and we all get to work on these projects together where I get to help redesign streams and rivers to be healthier for salmon and aquatic species. And for me, being able to give back to the salmon after they've helped support me and my health and my family my entire life is such a rewarding process. And being like, I, I can be a future leader in this and that I had to just trust that there was going to be a need for me in the future. And there is, and just kind of getting to live my dream job where I get paid an engineering salary to make salmon happy <laughs> and in turn make my tribe happy because our salmon population is really tied to my tribe's health and including mental health and making it so that future generations can have that privilege I did of fishing on the river. And I get to be outside half the day when I'm doing these projects and look at streams and rivers and get to go to all these cool places. And for me, it's just very exciting. And again, I, I never thought these opportunities were open to me or paths. And that it's kind of it's that's kind of one of the hard things about being native or underrepresented in these things is sometimes you have to make your own path. But the more of us who do it, the more opportunity we can make for each other and the easier it will continue to be. So that's my hope. And even though I had to forge a lot of my own past, there's still all the other natives that I look up to in American Indian Science and Engineering Society who were older and got to teach me about how do you network? How do you do job interviews? How do you do these different things? How do you make these network connections that help you get forward in the career that previously weren't there, but they helped make those tools so I could have an easier time. And I think it'll just keep getting better from here. And you have people like me and Dean Bull to help you out if you want to go into college engineering. I, I'm volunteering you. I hope that's <laughs> okay, Dean. Um, but we'll be here for you when you, if you want to decide to go on a path in STEM and, you know, maybe even if it, that isn't even in college or that's just on your own time and interests, there's going to be ways that your indigeneity can be involved in STEM and reasons that's important. That was beautiful. Thank you both for sharing that. It's always so nice to hear about what anybody is passionate about. I feel like it lights up people's faces. Um, it's beautiful. There was a comment dropped in the chat. Oh, this is from Elizabeth Stock, who is our interim director. Um, and she just wanted to comment on what a great conversation this is. And she's glad that is being recorded. I am too. I'm excited for our Mesa students to hear all about um, our, uh, you know, our community, because Dean Bull and Brooke are very much connected to the Oregon Mesa community. And I think that's what's really beautiful is that um, being housed at MCAX, you know, we we have the ability to have Dean Bull join us tonight. And then Brooke has stayed connected to Oregon Mesa even after graduating from Franklin in 2014. And it's it's really nice to be able to host these events. Um, I'm going to the next question, which is also a two part question. It is, what parts of your identity have been your greatest asset in your career journey? And then a follow-up to that is that being Native American is not a monolith. And that, you know, to follow up on that, what are parts of your identity that you feel proud of that others don't get to see? And how have those things played into your career path? Those are a lot of questions. <laughs> I, we can keep going back and forth, Dean Bull. Uh, for, for me, some of the parts of my 
identity that have been the greatest asset is me growing up with my language. I know not everyone has the privilege of growing up with their indigenous languages, but I was very fortunate for my grandfather to have been in my household with me and taught me language on the daily. When, when he was younger, he was taken to boarding school and they tried to force him to forget the language. And because he was afraid of what would happen to his kids, and because we didn't get the right to religious freedom until 1978, he never taught his kids how to speak the language. And so for me, I speak it better than my dad and my aunts and uncles do, actually. And that has been such an important way of thinking about the world, because knowing a different language helps you see the world in a different way. And this goes for all different languages, too, not just indigenous languages. But for me, in my language, for example, we have a larger time scale. And so we don't have just words for like doing this tomorrow or yesterday, past, present, and future tense. We have more tenses. So we have way, way, way in the future, a little bit in the future, something that's happening now, something that's happening perpetually right now, like always happening, something that happened in the past, something that happened a long time ago, and something that happened a long, long, long time ago. And so for me, having that in my language and in my mindset gives me a broader sense of perspective that many people who grew up just speaking English don't have. And so, for example, when I'm thinking about an engineering project, like a dam, which usually gets put in between 40 to 80 years, there's no plan to ever take that dam down. And because the engineer is going to retire by the time that dam has to come down or they're going to be dead. <laughs> Either way, they're not liable for, um, liable for it, what happens. And there's the assumption that future engineers will have a better understanding of how to take that dam down or hold new technology. But if we decided and designed dams from the get-go to be able to take them down easier from the start, we'd have a lot easier time right now when we're currently taking down dams on the Klamath River and have an understanding of, for example, what that waste could be used for in the future or how to make these dams less wasteful when they are taken down. But I don't think those are always considerations in like this entire lifespan of how to make decisions for future generations is always in place with an English thinking mindset. And just the concept of being good and thinking good thoughts and applying that to my everyday life, that's like a Iraq concept and that's helped me out through my entire time is, you know, even when things get rough or someone's kind of mean to you, you know, just keeping that positive attitude and knowing that protecting your spirit is what you have to do at the end of the day. Um, and then as far as it comes to how I feel um, proud of others or what others don't get to see in my heritage, in my career path is probably the fact that I have the privilege to see such beauty in nature because growing, my reservation is right on the Klamath River and in the middle of the Redwood Forest. And so I got to grow up playing in the woods, playing in the dirt and building fires when I probably should have been supervised. But <laughs> just having this experience where I got to really observe nature and have a good understanding of it from my observations and almost doing the scientific method. Like if I build this boat a certain way when I'm racing leaf boats with my cousins in the stream how does me changing this boat making it heavier changing the shape change how fast it goes so I can beat my cousins I'm really competitive um and then then I got to apply that to when I was the captain of the concrete canoe team at Portland State University where we literally build and race canoes made out of concrete and I got to take those observations that I had as a kid living on the reservation where people have this mindset that I grew up, well, and I did grow up very poor, but that is only a disadvantage to me where I got a lot of insight and growth from the way I grew up with my family on the res and it's helped me become a better engineer. Awesome, thanks, Brooke. Um, yeah, so, so I guess, yeah, there's just so many things that come to mind, but I, I guess I'll, I'll focus on a, a couple things. So, you know, um, I think one one part of being Lenape that's been very beneficial to me in my my career is, you know, sort of historically our 
our tribe was was known as as grandfathers by other tribes in the northeast because we were respected as peacemakers and were wise in, in settling disputes and you know I, I guess in some ways that that has sort of translated to me and sort of having a positive outlook and and looking for the best in people and and trying to uh you know navigate what what isn't always the best situation in sort of the best best way and you know um it's not like you know when I was a kid I I didn't even I, I didn't know any professors I didn't know what a dean was and it's not like I I set out to be a dean but um you know in, in some ways uh you know, probably the skill of being able to bring people together and and navigate, uh, you know, things where people may not always think the same same thing about things to find sort of common goals and shared vision has been really beneficial to me as a, an academic leader. And, you know, in a lot of ways that really does kind of go back to my, my upbringing and, and sort of how you know, how my my tribe sort of approaches things. I think the, the part that people don't see is is also very similar to what Brooke said in that, you know, I love the outdoors and the way I grew up with my family and spending a lot of time doing things outside is something that that still is very important to me. And and you know, whether it's hiking or fishing or or whatever, that the you know, I do spend a lot of time doing things out outdoors that people don't really see it at work and that's that's just so important to me ah that's awesome that's so lovely I love hearing the stories about like childhood and also like how that has a big impact on um just the way that you like grow up being curious about the world and because like a lot of the formative parts of our lives are when we're so young. And I feel like I've heard, you know, from Brooke and from Joe and just from past uh, your current friends that are also Native American, they have such a connection to the land and such a connection to their ecosystem. And it's um, yeah, it's so, so beautiful to hear about that too. Um, this question is, you know, big and it encompasses a lot of different parts of uh, your identity and who you are as a person. I think you both, you know, shared some really, really awesome insight into that. I'm going to go to our last question, which is fun, especially because um, our students, you know, always want to know and relate what they're currently doing in Mesa or what they learn in Mesa, what they show at Demo Day and at Mesa Day. Um, it's really nice to relate those projects to um, what professionals in fields that they might be interested in pursuing, what they do in their day-to-day -day jobs or just, you know, in your work can mean the work that you do in your day job, but it can also be work that you have done in the past. Um, but yeah, how is your work related to the project that students do in Mesa? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I think I think it's my turn and trade on that. So, um, you know, in in so many ways, the you know Mesa is uh, you know intertwined with with the Massey College, and that that you know Miss, the the college has been so involved with with Mesa and the the things that students do. I think give them such a good introduction to. Uh, STEM and, and engineering that that there, there's a real close relationship. But you know what what I would would say though, you know, for me both in my research and and in my current role as a as a dean, the the things that are so closely related is sort of that curiosity and that that problem solving. And you know, one of the the things that I think is the most valuable in as an engineer is is creativity and being able to think about things from a new new perspective and you know that kind of relates to to the earlier comment about an indigenous knowledge and sort of a native perspective on things being 
different than the way, you know, perhaps, um, you know, the, the Western culture thinks about things or whatever, but on the, the also related to that is sort of having the, the curiosity that goes with being a student, particularly a young student. And if I think back to my, my childhood and, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know if, if you know, in many ways, I just feel like, you know, so grateful to have had the parents I did and to have grown up the way I, I did and the, the, you know, my, my mom and my dad and the, the way, you know, particularly the, they thought about learning things and the importance of learning things and figuring things out. And I just think of, of that being kind of what, what Mesa is about is, you know, here's, here's a problem or an activity and go figure something out. And, you know, yes, the, the math and science really matter, but, but kind of that curiosity and creativity are, are things that that really carry over, uh, you know, later in life and and being an engineer. Yeah, thank you for that. I was also going to say I'm not entirely sure if I know 100% sure what a dean is, so maybe you could explain that too, um, because I'm sure a lot of people don't know what a dean actually does. I just know it's very important. Yeah, thanks for that. I'll I'll try to be really concise about it. You know, so so in, in some ways you would say that the dean is sort of the the chief executive officer of the college. So you know, all of the things that that go uh, on in the college are sort of um, you know in in some way bubble up to report on to the the dean. And and you know, it's it's not like I I run the college by myself. I have a great team of associate deans and department chairs and and staff and um you know faculty and 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 all of that. But you know ultimately it's it's you know most of the time gets spent on sort of the vision for the the college and you know a lot of big picture things. I'd say probably about half of the job is external face on things. So engage on community and, and other stakeholders, industry, donors, um, things like that. And then probably about half of the job is inward face on things, faculty and student and students. And you know, if I were gonna summarize it, I would say, you know, most of most of the job is really about being helping other people be successful and accomplish their goals. Um, and to me, that's a really fun piece of it. I always give give kind of the example, you know, being a fishing guide. So I, I really like to fish and, and that's partly because of how I grew up and that, you know, uh, when we we lived in in New Orleans before we moved here, that I had a boat and, you know, I would take take my wife and other people out fishing and and the way people fish there uh out in the salt water fly fishing is you have a, a push pull and and somebody stands on the back of the boat and pulls the the boat along very quietly and you you try to find the fish and a lot of times the fish's tail will stick up out of the water and then you cast a fly to the fish and try to to make it think this clump of either feather and furs or synthetic stuff tied to hook something to eat and eat it and for me it was just as fun to be if not more fun to be the person on the back of the boat help them help them the angler find the fish and catch the fish and not actually catch on a fish myself but you know i i was like catch on fish myself but the the help on somebody else do it was fun and that's what i think of a dean being that's a great analogy especially since i'm a fish person so i appreciate all fish themed stories uh, <laughs> for me, I, I think taking a step back aside from what Dean Bull said about the curiosity and that sense of adventure when it comes to engineering and putting these things application, for me, it's almost like the project management aspect has really stuck out to me and been beneficial for Mesa. So project management is kind of like being the boss or deciding how the timing and what you do goes into a project because that's kind of overlooked, but ends up being a really important part of making anything come and become a reality. And actually that's a whole part of engineering. Like you learn your section of engineering. So for me, civil engineering, but then there's project managers in civil engineering, not just designers, and they actually get paid more. Uh, <laughs> so don't, don't think just like the end product is always the most important part. It's also how you get there. How are you managing your time? How are you not, how are you taking care of yourself when you're managing that and other people on your team? So you're not 
at each other's necks and cranky all the time because something they get turned in or someone didn't do their part of the job. How do you have accountability with that? How do you make group rules? How do you make sure if something happens where it's unplanned, how do you recover from that and plan that from the get-go so you're not coming up to a crisis on the day of the competition where <laughs> things are falling apart or you forgot to submit a paper. So for me, looking back, understanding how to manage my own time and how to work in a team, even though I'm sure you'll hear this many times, and I know it can be annoying to work in a team, but it is really beneficial. And there are a lot of tools that you can learn how to make it successful because even though it might seem like the end product is the most important thing, a lot of the times to get that really good quality end product, it will require that planning and organization throughout the whole process that is harder to see when you're just looking at it at the end and think someone has a really cool project, but there's a lot more that goes into that. That's never actually what's going on with your hands or being built. And so that's carried with me this entire time. And I use project management and scheduling and how to allocate my resources, like how to use what I have properly on a daily basis in school and also in my engineering job. That's wonderful, especially to hear directly from Brooke, who did Oregon Mesa in in high school or in middle school too. In both? I, I, I can't remember if it's both, but I definitely high school. I feel like I just always doing something after school with Stan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so wonderful that that was available at, um, at your high school, because if I had had Oregon Mesa at my middle school or high school, I would have been I would have been the first to sign up, but I, I didn't have that. Um, but yeah, that's that's the end of our our questions for our guest speakers. I realize I probably should have started with this, but I put it off till the end. Um, I don't know why, but I still wanted to call out um, the land that we're on at Portland State University and um, read our Portland University's land, land acknowledgement, um, just because it's it's always important to recognize the, the land that I'm on. I physically, I'm not in uh, Portland, so I'm currently in Washougal, Washington. Washougal is a native name. Um, it's on where the land that I'm on is Chinook and Cowlitz land. And um, I'm uh, constantly reminded of uh, the folks that came here before us. And I'm, I'm very thankful to, to be part of it college where the dean is a native american um tribe member that's it's just it feels really really important to to call out um the, the land that we're on so i'll read portland state university's land acknowledgement uh portland state university is located on in the heart of downtown portland oregon in multnomah county and i may be saying these names not as they are supposed to be pronounced i may be saying them um, how they have been kind of anglo-sized. Um, so Multnomah might not be the correct way to say it. I, I, If Brooke or Dean Bull know how the correct way to say any of these tribe names, please correct me, because I would like to know the correct way to say them. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on. The Multnomah, the Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of, of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. Brooke and Joseph Bull, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I would love um, if you have any contact information or anything you want to shout out, um, we would love to drop it in the chat or um, include it in the description of the YouTube video. If uh, there's any, any resources for our students that you would like us to include, um, you can go ahead and let us know now or you can send them to us afterwards. We'll include them in the description. Um, however, I really, really appreciate that both of you have agreed to kind of be resources to our Oregon Mesa students and 
Um, we're really happy that you joined us tonight for installment two of Career Conversations. Thank you so much. Excellent. Yeah, thank um, you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't want to move on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I, I think I'll probably follow up separately with some information. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, I see Brooke dropped her website in the chat. Thank you so much. And Brooke's Instagram. Uh, yeah. is in the and chat any students. Well please feel free to message me on Instagram or through my website anytime you have questions or even when you're looking at colleges, if you have questions around that. So think of me as a resource and don't be afraid to reach out. Yeah, likewise, I'm happy to, to chat with, with folks. So feel free to reach out. Yeah, that's, that's uh, so wonderful to have you all as a part of our Oregon Mesa community. And if... Uh, you're watching this on YouTube, we will have this link um, to our feedback form in the chat. Uh, we're always looking for feedback and also for any speaker recommendations um, for the future. We are continuing our career conversation series. They are at a delay. So Native American Heritage Month was in November um, and it's currently January 30th, 2023. So we are going to next move on to, I believe, in February, but it's going to be in late February, um, a career conversations highlighting Black heritage. Um, so uh, at the end of Black History Month, we will have, that will be our next installment. So keep an eye out for that. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. It's wonderful. All right. I think I'm going to stop the recording right now.